and I want to welcome also Virginia's 74th governor. Yes, thank you. Governor Glenn Youngkin. Uh, we're going to have a discussion that lasts about an hour or so, uh, but we're going to leave some time for questions. So there is supposed to be a number on the screen. You can text your questions in, and we will try and get to those as we can. Um, in Governor, we can take a seat. Thank you. Um, just a quick bio. I don't know that you need an introduction, but just in case, as many of you may be aware, Glenn Youngkin was elected the 74th governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia in November 2021. Before that, he spent a career in private equity. He was CEO of the Carlisle Group, and he has been married for 28 years to his amazing wife, Suzanne, a native Texan. Actually, from Austin. She went to Austin High. And, uh, and I was married at St. David's Church right up the road. And uh, it is just so much fun to be here. And later today, I get to go visit my wife's parents uh, who are living at the Carincia. And so it's a very exciting day for me to be in Austin. And thank you for having me. The governor and I both married Texans. Beyond that, he's the governor and I'm in the media. Um, all right, let's get to work uh, because I want to try and leave some time for questions and not completely hog the spotlight, although I'll hog it a little. Uh, we're in Texas. There are a lot of Republican voters here. Want to announce a 2024 presidential bid? I I'm kidding. A little. Let me ask the question this way, because you have been getting these questions a lot in public and private settings. What do you think about when you contemplate the idea of running for president and what goes through your mind when you think about the possibility of mounting a presidential campaign? Let me begin with, uh, I am always humbled uh, when someone asks me this question and we really haven't contemplated. And the primary reason is that I've got a giant job that I'm doing. Uh, I was elected uh, last November in the Commonwealth of Virginia, a state that had turned very blue. And uh, we, in fact, went to work right out of the box and put forth an agenda that I think represented the, the common sense solutions to a lot of kitchen table issues that I think are, that are on all Americans' minds today. And, and so when this topic comes up, uh, I'm constantly reminded that I'm new to this. And in fact, that we have a lot of work to do in Virginia. Now we've accomplished a lot. And one of the, I think, great things that happened on January 15th is we went to work right away. And we went to work to combat inflation and bring cost of living down. We have a $4 billion tax cut package that we got through a bipartisan legislation. Uh, our General Assembly is controlled uh, on the House side by Republicans and on the Senate side by Democrats. And we got a $4 billion tax cut package through we, in fact, increased funding for law enforcement at a record level. We have a record, we have a record education budget this year to give teachers raises and fund schools, but also introduce choice. And so we went to work right away also to empower parents. And what we saw last year in the Virginia election was Republicans and Democrats, independents, moderates, coming together in such a unique way around the idea that these kitchen table concerns that yes, included real concerns about inflation and real concerns about crime, but, but an extraordinary focus on schools and, and parents' rights in those schools with making decisions for their children. And so we had a chance to go to work right away and, and pass bipartisan legislation to empower parents to make decisions with regards to whether their child wears a mask or not, and whether there's materials in the classroom that aren't consistent with their values. Uh, and then. I finally am so excited about the fact that we've been able to press forward on topics that don't require General Assembly approval. And I think this is where I found my role as governor to be, to be so rewarding. We in fact worked with our colleges to keep tuition flat in almost every state-run college this year. That's an extraordinary moment in a time when we see inflation running away from us. And so when I see uh, folks step back and ask this humbling question about 2024, it's just very easy for me to, to uh, really very candidly say, we're not thinking about 2024, we're focused on 2022. We've got a huge job to do. 
Uh, economic development had been stalled in Virginia, and, and we've had Boeing and Raytheon come to Virginia with headquarters. Lego announced their only U.S. major manufacturing in Virginia. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're going to deliver, and these are the kind of things we're going to get done for Virginia voters. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for continuing to <laughs> have the discussion. And I'm not a Virginia voter, so I, I can ask you any question I want, and I don't have to worry about an audit. Yes, um, but I would say, David, I'd love for you to be a Virginia voter. And so if you would move across the Potomac River and join us in Virginia, you're all welcome. My friends will be very happy uh, that you made the pitch. Um, there's been a lot of focus on uh, various Republican governors, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. What differentiates you from some of your Republican colleagues? This is a topic that I was asked all during the campaign. Who are you like? Who are you different from? And I found myself answering the question in a little bit different way, which is, well, let me tell you about me. And uh, I ran as a Virginian for Virginia voters based on a clear belief that small government and low taxes were really important. That's a throwback. How about that? Republicans don't talk and, about that anymore. And how about, how about standing up for law enforcement and funding in record raises? And how about addressing education with a new way to think about it, which is, in fact, to fund into teacher salaries and to fund into school construction and to also introduce choice through our lab school initiative that's never been in Virginia before. I believe that government can be run better. And what I have found bringing my 30-year business career into the governor's office is that it can be run better. And it is so exciting to see us, in fact, run it more efficiently. We had 1.2 billion dollars of appropriated money that we didn't need to spend during our fiscal year that ended on June 30th. $1.2 billion that didn't need to be spent that we, in fact, get to put into our reserve funds and return to taxpayers. That's really exciting. So I believe that there are extraordinarily talented Republican governors. What we do know is that states that have been run by Republican governors have outperformed states that were run by Democrat governors coming out of this pandemic in such an extraordinary way. Economic growth, education success, and therefore I'm pleased to see so many Republican governors doing a great job for their constituents. We're going to get to some of that in a minute, but first I wanted to ask you about Donald Trump. Dominant figure in your party, so I'm told. What did he get right? I think he, he uh, was very successful in pressing forward with, with policies that address so many of our kitchen table concerns around the nation. Um, you know, there are real issues. And when we see what's happened in the Biden administration with inflation, when you allow runaway spending in an unchecked fashion, and the silent thief of inflation invades hardworking Virginians' homes, stealing three, four, five, six thousand dollars of their hard-earned money. We have got to get our economy back under control so that Virginians and Americans and Texans can live their dream. I, I also believe that basic principles of standing up for law enforcement are critical. And we've seen the idea that we can in fact deplete resources and demean law enforcement result in runaway violent crime. And we just know that's wrong. And then we've seen the primacy of parents and education and the absolute desire to have high expectations, not watered down expectations, be such an important part of our education system. I believe these are things that President Trump got very right. And I think these are things that Americans see today as we've watched the liberal policies that have come out of Washington be put into, put into play that have that have really resulted in bad outcomes, runaway inflation, rising crime, poor outcomes in schools, and candidly, a lot of Americans and Virginians all of a sudden wondering whether they can pursue their dream. And that's why I think what happened in Virginia last year is so important. Because last year, Virginians stood up and said, we want a different direction. See, Virginia has an off-year election, and we had had eight years of Democrat governors, and we had had single-party rule in Virginia for the last few years. And those same sort of policies were put to play in Virginia. And I often say that they were trying to make Virginia California, and they, in fact, even tied Virginia to California regulations. Um, 
Virginians don't want that. And oh, by the way, Virginians want to be governed by folks they elect, not by another state's elected officials. These issues are the ones that I believe continue to be at the forefront of Americans' concerns. And the way we've addressed them in Virginia with common sense solutions, getting out of the box right away with bipartisan support, because that's the way we have to do things, I think demonstrates that these kinds of common sense solutions are in fact the right solutions for the challenges of today. What did Donald Trump get wrong? I believe that, I believe that we, have to, we have to bring people together at a time when we need to show that there is a path forward. Again, what we were able to do in Virginia last year is bring people together. A state that had elected Democrats and Senates and Senate seats and statewide uh, governors and lieutenant governors and attorney general. Um, we, in fact, stepped back and we brought people together that had never been in the same room together. Forever Trumpers, never Trumpers, Tea Party, Libertarians, independent moderate voters, and a lot of Democrats around a platform that was very clear a conservative, common-sense platform that had tangible measures for results. We were able to campaign places that Republicans usually don't campaign, and, and the result of that is we won the Latino vote, and we won the Asian vote, and, and we received more of the black vote than uh, a Republican could remember. And we won in areas of Virginia that Republicans hadn't won, Greater Richmond, our Hampton Roads area, down by the beach, and yet, we still had the highest percentage of voting in our traditionally red counties. I think we can bring people together around these common sense solutions, and I think that's what Virginians wanted last year, and I think that they're pleased with the ability to get things done, deliver results on their behalf. You know, I frequently say that I have 8.6 million bosses in Virginia, and oh, by the way, I hear from them frequently. <laughs> um, and our job is to deliver outcomes. Uh, I do believe that we made a lot of promises during our campaign, and, and we have delivered on virtually all of them. Uh, and that's a track record that I'm very proud of. Um, it's not a me thing, it's a we thing. And uh, I'm so proud of our General Assembly and coming together around these most important issues. You know, the reality is, is when you, when you turn Twitter and Facebook off, and you close the door, and you have a conversation about what's right, not, not what's left or right politically, but what's right versus wrong from a judgment standpoint, you can pull people together and get an enormous amount done. It sounds like what you're saying is that it's not just important as a policymaker, as an elected official, what you do, but how you go about doing it. Absolutely. I mean, in the world of business that I came from, if you, in fact, don't listen to your shareholders and speak to your customers and and design a strategy that includes bringing your whole workforce together in order to deliver against that strategy in, in order to be successful, then you'll be out of a job. <laughs> and in my previous world, you got fired for not, not achieving what you said you were gonna do. And I approached this job the exact same way, the exact same way, which is I have 8.6 million bosses, and my job is to deliver for them every day. That's one way to describe 2020. Um, let me shift gears a little bit and um, ask you about uh, some of the campaigning that you are doing across the country for Republican candidates and Republican governors running for re-election. Uh, I want to pose the question this way. Uh, you want a rather blue state. I mean, for the past decade or so, Virginia had really become a blue state. President Joe Biden won Virginia by 10 points, yes. maybe a little bit more than 10 points. Yes. You won Virginia by about two points. Yeah. It's suspicious. Okay, I, I don't really mean it's suspicious. I think you won, and I think it's pretty clear that you won. Uh, but you're headed to Arizona to campaign for Carrie Lake, the Republican nominee for governor. She continues to insist that the presidential election was stolen, that President Trump won and Joe Biden lost, despite every count and recount nationally in Virginia and other states, not in Virginia, excuse me, in Arizona. Virginia, yeah. <laughs> we didn't, nobody argued with Virginia, and nobody argued with your gubernatorial victory. Um, everything was stolen. How do, you, how do you square, given your approach to politics, uh, campaigning for somebody, the term often is election denier. I, I don't like the term uh, because I think it conflates the issue with other issues where we use the term denier. 
somebody that undermines American and state institutions by insisting you can't trust the outcome and not pledging to honor the outcome of future elections if she's in a position of power. Let me begin with just a, just a clear recognition of something I mentioned before, which is the success of Republican governors leading states coming through the pandemic and out of the pandemic. And the data is overwhelming about the economic progress, job recovery, uh, uh, mitigating the loss of learning uh, for the most important resource that we have as America, our children. Um, this data is so overwhelming, uh, and what I firmly believe uh, is that all states deserve a Republican governor. And in fact, what we've seen in Virginia is a stark example of that. Because I was elected in 2021, and therefore was able to go to work in a state that had been blue and demonstrate what I believe are conservative common sense solutions to problems and the progress that we've made, I think that I'm uniquely positioned to share this perspective. See, coming out of the pandemic, Virginia was ranked 47th in the nation in job recovery. Our schools were kept shut, locked tight. There was not full in-person learning until September of 2021. Small businesses were shut. I, to, be, to, to put a, put a pin on this, um, we have a border with Tennessee, and there's a city called Bristol, Virginia that was locked tight. And across Main Street is Bristol, Tennessee that was wide open. And Virginia businesses shut, and Bristol, Tennessee businesses thrived. And so as we've moved into our, our, our administration quickly, I mean, there's no time to waste, we've moved from being 47th in the country in job recovery to top 20. And we've had big wins with companies moving and getting open. And it's so much fun to talk to people who say, hey, I've just moved to Virginia from Ohio or from California, um, and maybe even a few Texans. And, uh, and that has been so exciting to see this shift. And so I do believe that Republican governors flat are doing a better job. And therefore, I am so honored to be in a position to take some time, not too much, because I have a huge job to deliver for Virginia voters to help Republican candidates and a few seated Republican governors either rewin or, in fact, win and turn a blue state red. And in particularly in Arizona, Doug Ducey did an extraordinary job. Extraordinary job. Reduced taxes, school choice and reform in their, in their K through 12 system. And I think the people of Arizona deserve a Republican governor. And you think that they deserve a Republican, well, let me, let me ask it, uh, redirect in, in this way. I, I imagine there would be some, um, some issues by which you would choose not to support with your time and energy uh, particular candidates regardless of party affiliation. Um, but the idea that there are certain Republicans who don't want to recognize election results doesn't meet that test. You are comfortable supporting Republicans that have issues or dispute the outcome of the last election. I am comfortable supporting Republican candidates. And we don't agree on everything. I mean, I have said that I uh, firmly believe that Joe Biden was elected president. Now, I have to say, in all candor, I wish he wasn't, um, because I, th I don't think he's done a good job for America. I don't think he has led well. And we can see it in every aspect of Americans' lives today. We can see our foreign policy that has been weakened substantially. We're no longer strong. I think we're weak. I do believe that we have seen our, our entire approach to the border be, be, in fact, abdicated. And we have a national security issue today. And oh, by the way, our border is a national crisis. Every state is a border state. We have record overdoses in Virginia, and 60% of them are from fentanyl. And we know where that fentanyl comes from. I mean, this is a national catastrophe. We've seen inflation run away from us. We're seeing crime escalate. He hasn't done a good job. The reality in Virginia, and I'm very, very focused on Virginia, is that Virginia has fair and accurate elections. 
This past week, I actually went to one of our voting centers and I participated in the certification of the counting machines that in fact are used when we vote. And I was able to inquire and question, and I'm very comfortable with our process in Virginia, and yet we continue to improve it. See, as a business guy, I know every process can get better, every process. And yes, there are concerns about our election process in America. And so my job as governor is to go to work in order to continue to improve it and then communicate what we're doing. So we passed three bills in Virginia this year on a bipartisan basis. Bill number one is we update our voter rolls now every week for anybody who sadly and unfortunately has passed away in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Bill number two is we outlawed outside money coming in to fund any part of our election process, otherwise known as Zuckerbox, and we outlawed it. And we said, we're not going to do that. And the third was that all mail-in ballots now are assigned directly to a precinct. So we actually can match numbers. It provides more transparency. And then we talk about the fact that every voter in Virginia has a paper ballot, and they're counted on machines that, in fact, aren't connected to the internet and, and are tested. So this process of investing in and improving an election process is critical. And I would just ask all governors to be as proactive to make sure that there's faith and trust in our election process. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. I, I didn't realize until I started uh, researching you a little bit that some years back you and your wife had uh, started a church. We did. Um, you're a man of deep faith. Religion is a, a big part of your life. Uh, talk about that. Well, it's actually something I'm really comfortable talking about because um, when I asked my wife to marry me, uh, she said, yes, but. And uh, she said, I'd love to marry you, but I need your commitment that you're going to put Jesus in the center of our lives. And, uh, and I was not a committed Christian at the time, and I didn't understand what she was asking me. I wanted to get married. Um, and if you've met my wife, you'll understand why. She's extraordinary. And she put me on a path that changed my life forever. And our faith guides us. Our faith strengthens us. Our faith gives us a confidence that we have a loving Lord. Our faith gives us the ability to step back and ask questions and to pray over answers. And so we uh, saw an opportunity in our community in Northern Virginia um, to bring friends together who maybe didn't have that same faith. And we started a church in our basement. Uh, it was extraordinary to have your neighbors come over to your house and uh, it's subsequently grown into a pretty big church. Um, and every time I'm able to attend, because I now live in Richmond, our state capital, but if on a Sunday morning I can get back to our home church, I do find myself overwhelmed when I look around and I don't recognize or know that many people. And that is a hallmark of success. How has your faith guided you as an elected official? Well, we pray a lot. <laughs> I wake up every morning. And I find myself uh, in quiet time thanking the Lord for putting me in this position. It is such an honor. It's such an honor to go to work every day on behalf of 8.6 million Virginians and to, and to know that what I'm doing today hopefully will make their lives better. And then I ask for help. <laughs> and, and I think um, that's, where, that's where I think my faith has been most impactful is that I can ask for help. Um, we start most of our big meetings with a prayer. Um, I ask others to pray together over issues in their lives. I have an extraordinary cabinet. When, when we won, people came to Virginia to serve Virginians, and we have mostly Virginians in our cabinet, but we had people come from all over the United States to serve with us and to walk our lives together, not just in government, but in lives. And, we have folks who have family members who are dealing with illnesses. We have folks that are repositioning their children in schools. And I just think it's a great opportunity for us to recognize that we're doing more than work together. We're living life together. Um, I know this goes without saying, but um, on the issue of abortion, you're pro-life, yes? Virginians elected a pro-life governor. And I was very clear about that all through the campaign. Uh, we find ourselves in a, in, in a situation today um, reflecting what I believe was a very good decision from the Supreme Court to, to remand to the states the right to make these decisions. How did you feel 
uh, when the Dobbs decision was handed down? As I said, I, I felt that the decision was correct. Uh, this is a decision that should be made by voters, by citizens. In Virginia, uh, I'm very cognizant of where we are in Virginia. Um, we have, a, as I said, a divided state legislature. Um, and this is an issue where people, like they are in America, are all, are all across the spectrum. Um, I quickly uh, called uh, our senior, most respected state legislators to try to come together around a bipartisan solution. I felt that a, a bill that would recognize that a, that a baby, a child, can feel pain at about 15 weeks was a, was a reasonable place to try to pull people together. You see, in Virginia, just 20 months ago, there were debates on our General Assembly floor about legalizing abortion all the way up through and including birth, paid for with taxpayer money. I view that as extreme. I view that as very extreme. And I think Virginians do as well. Virginians have elected a pro-life governor. They've made a comment that they want fewer abortions as opposed to more. And that's why I'm hopeful that uh, on a bipartisan basis, a bill can be brought to my desk in January when our General Assembly reconvenes. And we can actually have a solution as opposed to an argument. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but I believe the, the policy you favor it would allow for abortions up to 15 weeks, but throughout pregnancy would include exceptions for rape, incest, and the mother's health. That's correct. Is that what you believe, is that, do you support that because that is what is politically feasible in Virginia? Or, you know, if you were king of the Commonwealth for a day, uh, or governor of a, a state like, you know, Idaho or Oklahoma, would you rather have a more, have more expansive abortion restrictions? So I do believe in the cases of rape and incest and when the mother's life is in jeopardy, that exceptions should be made. And I've said that from the very beginning. Um, you know, those circumstances, uh, I believe, are extraordinary. And, and therefore, I do believe that exceptions should be made. Um, I've been clear from, on that from the beginning. I've prayed over that topic extensively, and, uh, and I firmly believe it. Um, you were just mentioning that what Dobbs did was remand abortion to the states, and now states individually can come up with their own abortion policies. Uh, but for Americans who um, are very concerned, are, are pro-life on the issue of abortion, and are concerned that in many blue states you will still have expansive abortion policies, uh, such as the kind that you were discussing uh, were possible in Virginia earlier. Uh, there have been, among some of them, uh, calls for national legislation. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina re recently proposed what, a bill that would outlaw abortions after 15 weeks. Now, I, what I wanted to ask is, are you a state's rights guy, and you want each state to be able to deal with this issue as, as it sees fit, as its voters see fit, or would you like to see national legislation um, so that in states that would otherwise allow very expansive pre-Dobbs abortions, abortion policy, that could be addressed? So I want to remind everybody, I am a homegrown Virginian. And there were a few influential Virginians uh, who were present at the founding of this great country, one of which was a gentleman named Thomas Jefferson. And, uh, and I believe in states' rights. I believe that the federal government consistently overreaches. And I believe that there's a, a, a consistent path to forget that states, in fact, have the ability to deal with these issues based on their voters' desires. And so this is one of those circumstances. As I said earlier, I felt that the Dobbs decision was consistent with that philosophy. And in Virginia, we are working through a difficult issue. And I believe we'll work through it. I'm confident that we can come together on something that Virginians can support. Um, I, have, I have my own personal beliefs. And this is a moment where I've got to work together in order to get an outcome that I think moves us forward against the extreme view that was being debated on the Virginia General Assembly floor to something that I believe is better. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your business career and how it has influenced the job you're doing as governor. Um, I checked around a bit and 
um, of course this fascinates a nerd like me, that when you're in uh, private meetings with, with donors and, and party people, you talk often about how you like to bring a, a, a business sense, a business savvy to your job as governor. Somebody said I should ask you in particular how you've been in this regard approaching Virginia's bank accounts and department budgets. That they, like you will go on until they finally tell you, Governor, sir, please, we have other questions we need to get to. Well, first of all, I started out my working life early, taking out trash and washing dishes. And I understand what it means to serve customers, and I also understand what it means to be yelled at occasionally. I think everybody should start their career in food service, by the way. Um, but what I learned along the way, um, and through 25 years of my career at, at the Carlisle Group, where I started at a started at an entry level position and, and had the great privilege of let working my way up to the top. Let me I hate doing this, but will you explain, partly for me, but I think when we hear the word private equity, we think of people in suits moving around lots of money. Yeah. What is it that you did? Yeah. Um, so, so what I loved about my world at private equity was that we would work with companies to help grow them. And so we would sit down with management teams and, and we would listen to their vision about how their company could, could grow and, and have uh, more impact on their customers and launch new products and expand. And then we would together work through a business plan and bring together, yes, uh, money in order to help fund it, but also active engagement with them in order to achieve their plan. Um, I have to say, we, we were good at it. Um, <laughs> And so when, we, when, we, when I came into government, I just find myself in that exact same mode, which is well, we, don't, we have room for improvement, sometimes massive room for improvement in so many things that we do. And I found myself as I went around and, and I go meet with every agency and every department. Now I'm told that no governor has ever done that. Um, and I don't know why, um, because these are the people that in fact make state government work. And, uh, and so I, I ask questions like, are we good at what we do and how do we know? How, what are we measuring? What are our objectives for the year? Um, and also, how are you doing versus budget? <laughs> and what we found is that the idea of measuring month to month against budget wasn't really done. And so we have, a, as I said, a fabulous cabinet and our Secretary of Finance uh, who had run big banks uh, said, I can figure this out. I can get you monthly financials. And the next thing we found out was that um, there was a run rate that people were spending that was substantially below what had been appropriated. And in fact, we could accomplish everything we wanted and in fact underspend authorizations. And so the fiscal year ended and we had $1.2 billion that went unspent. $1.2 billion that in fact we were able to put into our rainy day reserve funds and pre-fund an account for taxpayer relief. It's taxpayer money not the government's money. And I just think we can, we can run this better. And I'm so pleased that we've been able to do that so quickly. $1.2 billion used to be real money. Yeah, it's real money. <laughs> it's real money to Virginians. Uh, brings me to my next question. Um, you know, when, I, when your campaign for governor began at the very outset, and I went back and I watched some of the ads, and I just wanted to refresh my memory, but I, you know, I live in the Washington media market, so I saw some of them. You talked a lot about things like this, about government accountability and, and bringing, you know, a sense of running government more like a business. You didn't talk a lot, at least in the advertising, about cultural issues. Uh, some of the very hot button cultural issues surrounding public education, how we uh, d deal with the LGBTQ community. Um, and yet, given, um, the debate around critical race theory, given the debate around um, how to address uh, students who are transgender. It, it seems like you've become something of a culture warrior, sort of the opposite, and of course not leaving out one of the reasons you were elected governor because of uh, Governor McAuliffe's uh, line about parents not uh, being in charge of their children's education. So, so I, I understand where voters' heads were at when you were elected, but it seems like you started as a sort of business guy who was going to improve how government functioned and you've become something of a culture warrior. What about that? Let me begin with just a, a, a setting. When I, when I launched our, our, our campaign with my wife, 
And I will, oh, by the way, tell you that when I spoke to her about quitting my job that uh, I thought was my dream job and going to, going to run for governor, she thought I was having a midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> and we prayed over it and committed ourselves to this. Uh, and what we found as we prepared um, is that I just thought about this differently. I thought about the fact that we needed to bring voters together, but we also needed to be wholly transparent in the things that we were going to do and that we believe. And so when we launched our campaign, the week before, we did a statewide poll. And my name ID was 2%, and the poll had a margin of error of 3%. Now, did you, poll, did you poll your family? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a math guy, and, and what that means is that there were a lot of people who knew me and forgot. Um, so we were really coming from a place where folks needed to understand who I am and where I've come from and what I hope to do on their behalf in serving them. Um, there was no doubt about what I believe. I've been very transparent. My faith guides my family. Virginians elected a pro-life governor. I strongly believe that parents have the preeminent role in making decisions for their children. I don't think there's controversy in any of that. There may not be controversy, but it's not something that you discussed early in the campaign as a major talking point. It, it came later, as maybe as you traveled, but also as the former governor who you defeated opened the door wide for you and said, please, take the job that I want. Yeah. So we did talk about education extensively and the role of parents and getting schools open and making sure that we had curriculum that, that taught our children how to think, not what to think, that, that addressed the fact that in Virginia, standards had been lowered in order to mask lowering capability and proficiency scores. What happened, of course, was that Loudoun County became ground zero, not just for Virginia, but for the nation, on respecting parents primary role in parenting their children. It's about families. And, and what became clear, of course, was that the, the left liberal politicians wanted to insert bureaucrats and politicians between parents and their children. And we all knew it, but nobody was willing to say it. Well, my opponent said it. He said it clearly. And it wasn't a mistake. He was just affirming what the left liberal Democrats believe that they should parent, not you, that in fact, kids belong to the state. Well, they don't. Kids belong to families. And so that's where, this, that's where this campaign, I think, became more than just a state campaign. It became a national movement to recognize the primary role of parents in their kids' lives. There seem to be two dynamics of playing schools right now, at least as you're dealing with them, right? There's the cultural side, and I, I, I mapped this question out because I didn't want to mess it up, right? The cultural side, which is, what books are my kids reading? You know, is, is, are schools keeping secrets from parents? Are they telling my kid, you know, that he's privileged or she's privileged, and, and I don't like that? Then there's the other side, right, which is we just want schools open. We want, we want them to perform at a high level. Uh, where do you think, at least, where do you think parents are on these two issues, and, and how do you balance that? If I can just correct a little bit. Please. I don't think it is about picking books for kids. I think it is about make, allowing parents to have transparency and decision rights about whether those books conform with their family values. And some parents will make a decision that they do and some parents don't. So therefore, this is not a Republican versus Democrat issue around parents. We, we had parents from across the political spectrum, independents. We won the independent vote in Virginia. And we had massive numbers of Democrats walk across the aisle over this topic, the role of parents. When we, when we passed on a bipartisan basis a bill to address masking in school, we said parents get to make this decision, not bureaucrats. And therefore, if you want your child to wear a mask, they can. And if you do not want your child to wear a mask, they don't have to. This is the key. I, we, we constantly find ourselves in politics running at these or moments. You either believe this or you believe that. It becomes very policy driven as opposed to recognizing 
that the root issue here is about parents. And everything that we have done with regards to parents has been empowering them, putting them back into their children's lives. And oh, by the way, recognizing that the previous administration in Virginia excluded parents purposely. And I believe that's fundamentally wrong. And by the way, Virginia voters express loudly that they think that's wrong. Uh, but you do have critics, uh, particularly on your new uh, policy in dealing with transgender youth. So talk to us about why you think your critics are wrong. They claim that you're putting children at risk. Yeah. Um, and do you believe that your policy can survive the inevitable lawsuits? So for those of you who don't follow this every moment, um, but you might. We, You're here. We, we, recent, we recently issued guidelines on the role of parents with kids making very, very uh, important decisions, particularly around whether they believe that their gender matches their, their birth sex. The previous administration and the Democrat-controlled General Assembly had issued guidance, and, and th this guidance that they issued was radical. It was radical because it specifically excluded parents and facilitated schools making decisions without notifying parents. Now think through this. In, in, in schools today, at least in Virginia, if your child needs an aspirin, parents have to give a written note. But the school can engage in a discussion around a child's most most challenging decision probably that they're dealing with and they're not going to engage families and parents. And so I felt this needed to be corrected. And just based on the pure philosophy that a child deserves a parent in these decisions, a parent who's known them from before they were born, they deserve that. And parents have a fundamental right to be engaged in that decision. Our guidelines include the word bullying 36 times. We are very clearly first addressing the fact that every child should be loved, respected, their privacy should be, should be uh, protected, and oh, by the way, their safety must be protected. And we must have parents at the front of the line, not at the exclusion of a trusted teacher or counselor, but parents must be the first stop for these decisions. Can you survive the lawsuits? Because they are coming. I, I absolutely believe so. We have Virginia law that says parents have a fundamental right to make decisions with regards to their children's education, upbringing, and health. It's a law. We have constitutional protections for First Amendments. We, in fact, have, con we have federal law that says that the children don't belong to the state. Uh, but let me, let me back up. I don't really believe this is controversial. I really don't. I think that there is a, an extreme group of folks that um, have tried to embed a scary tactic here as opposed to reading the regulations. And I've asked everybody before you read a headline, read the regulations, because at the end of the day, these regulations also empower parents to make decisions for their children. And if they, in fact, make that decision, that the school should make accommodations for their child, the school will. And so this is just about putting parents back in the decision-making role that they deserve to be in. We're almost at the end of my time, so for those of you that have questions for Governor Yunkin, uh, now is a good time to prepare, get them in, um, and be ready to fire away. Um, there is n no topic that is off limits, although uh, let's keep it within the range of things that um, make him completely uncomfortable and wishes he had never come. What's the famous, what's the famous quote? You can ask me any question you want, and I'll answer the ones I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Which is another reason why you were elected governor. <laughs> uh, but before we get there, I, I wanted to um, close, my, uh, close our conversation w with this question. And, you know, it... it, it I got the idea from, from, I think it was your announcement video, um, and back when it was most likely your wife and four kids that believed you could win and, and nobody else. Um, you, you said that, that it has never been more important to come together than it is today. Now, it sounds like a, a throwaway line that any politician has to say, but in the environment that we are living in in the United States, 
um, it, it struck me, and, and, and I wanted to ask you uh, a, a, a twofer here. What do you think, and obviously you're focused on Virginia, but you're an American too, what do you think is the most pressing issue facing the United States today, the most fundamental pressing issue, and how do we begin to address it when we are at each other's throats so often? Now, look, I travel the country for campaigns. Not everybody is addicted to Twitter and, and screaming at people, or me for that matter, but we are in an era where we don't just disagree with people that hold different political opinions than ours. We question their patriotism, their intentions, they're out to get us. So how, what is the problem the country faces that is the biggest problem, and how do we do anything about it in an atmosphere like this? I think the biggest challenge we have is leadership. And it's not a particular policy, and it's not a particular issue, although there are some hugely challenging concerns and and when we look at inflation and we look at the state of education and we look at crime and we think about America's position around the world where we have in fact evacuated peace through strength and ceded really the upper hand I believe to China when we, we look at what's happening at the border it's become a national security issue we can go on and on and on the, the fentanyl and, and opioid epidemic in our nation today, mental health, which is just in a crisis moment coming out of the pandemic, I mean, these are all individually extraordinarily important topics. But I think the biggest challenge we have in America today is a failure of leadership. And I think that translates into a number of aspects. It's a lot more important than just saying, I want to bring people together. Because I think what Virginians were a little worried about was, was I going to be able to do it? And I think what we have seen in the Biden administration is that they're not doing it. They immediately ran to progressive liberal policies and failed to do what I think is most important, which is to stand for what's right. But they think that those policies are right. And now we know from watching the outcome that they are empirically proven not to be. <laughs> and they need to recognize this. How hard is it to recognize that an open border with 7,000 people flowing over the border every day is bad? And, and oh, by the way, the, 10 years ago, securing the border, building a wall, was a 100% issue in all politicians, and by the way, all Americans. And now it's become a political topic. We need to secure the border. We need to have a we need to have a, a common sense approach to deal with the huge numbers of people that want to come here. By the way, the reason why they want to come here is because America is the best country in the world. That's why they want to come. But what we found ourselves in all the time is a moment where there, when there is a chance to get back to core common sense principles, the Biden administration has failed. Doesn't, and, and my final question before we open it up to questions, though, isn't it up to elected officials not just to, to try and govern in the, way, in the way they believe is going to help Americans, but do you, do you have a responsibility to lower the temperature so that these bipartisan discussions and agreements can be fostered? I believe that as governor of Virginia, my job is to deliver on promises made because that's what I was elected upon. And I have to do it in a bipartisan basis because that's the construct we have in Virginia. I believe that calling people names and trying to score points on Twitter and Facebook is inconsistent with that. I have frequent Matthew 18 moments, which means rather than yell and scream at someone, I walk over and I close the door and I say, what is going on? How can we find a place where we can land? I'll reiterate, we had an aspirational agenda when we started on January 15th. And we went to work right away after I was inaugurated. We brought a change of clothes, we changed into work clothes, and we went to work on, on Saturday. And what I found over and over again is that when you turn Twitter off, you can in fact have reasonable conversations. Now listen, it's not 100%, but it is enough to get things done. And every bill that we passed 
has to be done in a bipartisan fashion, and we got it all done except one. And the one I can't understand, why we couldn't lower our gas tax for three months and save Virginians money when we had lots of money. I don't understand that. Why the Senate Democrats didn't vote for that um, when it benefited their constituents in an extraordinary way, I don't understand, but I think it was a political thing. But at the end of the day, I think a job of a, a leader is to bring people together around an outcome, and you're not gonna get everybody to agree. That's clear. That's democracy. That's why we, in fact, have heated debates. But our job is to get stuff done. And I think that there is a common sense landing place on most issues. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Question. OK. Uh, question number one that was texted in, should, pres should former President Trump seek re-election in 2024? So as we discussed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. As we, as we discussed, 2024 is a long way away. And I do believe that President Trump is gonna do what President Trump wants to do. And it's not my job to decide who should run and who shouldn't run. Um, and I think it's up to Americans to choose who they wanna nominate and, and elect. Um, I do think that when things roll into 2024, um, just like in my election, as we rolled into my election, there were lots of candidates that represented a variety of positions, and then voters went to work. And, and I think that's what we have to do in 2024. And so President Trump's gonna, gonna decide to do what he wants to do, and I do believe that uh, it'll be up to Americans to choose uh, who they want to lead them. Uh, next question is, why ban discussions on critical race theory? And could you describe an example of a book, text, or other writing used in Virginia schools that you consider to be critical race theory? Yeah, thank you. This is a really important topic because um, in Virginia schools, what, what we saw in curriculum was the infusion of judgmental ideas the infusion of ideas that, in fact, were, were speaking about uh, categorizing people as victims and oppressors, categorizing um, people as inherently racist because of their race or their religion or their sex. And that is what we are against. And so I signed an executive order on day one that these concepts, which, which really are divisive, um, should, should not be allowed in our curriculum in schools. And yes, it presents itself. It presents itself from teaching materials that are used to, to in fact, train staff. And we identified dozens and dozens and dozens of them, all the way through to simple things in the classroom, uh, like something called, like something called um, bingo, when in fact bingo really is deciding who is oppressed and who's a victim. That's in the classrooms. And so we, try, we tried very, very carefully to make sure that what we're talking about are real issues of infusing judgment into the classroom when, in fact, what we're supposed to be doing is teaching our kids how to think, not what to think. We coupled that with a very important and moment. And, and I believe this idea that we shove everything into or categories. You either believe this or you believe that. But I believe there's a real and moment here which is also teaching our history. Virginia has an extraordinary history. Our founding fathers uh, were not just the founding fathers of Virginia, but the founding fathers of America. Uh, and yet we have extraordinarily, extraordinarily deep and, and painful moments in our history. We should teach it all, all of it, the good and the bad. And we can do both. And that's what my executive order was about. And I think this is, again, a moment to bring people around the concepts of we are not going to judge or teach judgment in our classrooms. And we are going to teach all of our history. Because we can't know where we're going unless we know where we're from. And I think this is, again, a very important moment for us to try to come together around a topic that has been very hard to talk about. Next question is, does your faith blind you to the faith and commitments of others? And do you believe in the separation of church and state? 
So I hope my faith doesn't blind me to the beliefs of others. And in fact, I, I engage frequently with, with uh, all of our 8.6 million constituents, those that share my faith, those that share other faiths, uh, and in fact, those that uh, have no faith. And I think that's what my job is, to have 8.6 million bosses. I also believe that the idea of separation in church and state is real. I can't mandate somebody do something, and I shouldn't. But it also doesn't mean that I have to check my faith at the door in the job that I'm doing. And I do believe that Virginians are comforted by the fact that, that I'm transparent in my faith and that I, I am express the fact that I do ask for help every morning. And I recognize that I am far from perfect. In my faith, I believe there's only been one perfect person in the history of the world. And therefore, it's my job to try to learn from mistakes and not repeat them and to get as much help as I can. Uh, we got time for one more? Sure. Sure. What is your outlook on the 2022 midterms? I think the 2022 midterms are tight. <laughs> and, uh, and oh, by the way, that's what our democracy is all about. And as we head into this last sprint um, into early voting and, and uh, November the 8th, uh, I, think I, think, I think Virginians for our congressional races and Americans for governor's races and, and uh, all of the uh, other Senate, congressional, and local races uh, have real decisions to make. Um, I do believe that what we've talked about here today is really important for voters to consider. What is the track record of Republican governors? What, in fact, are the most important issues to impact lives, and what are the solutions to those, and where do they come from? And I believe on all of those issues, the Republican approach, this conservative common sense agenda of, of reigning in inflation and, and, and controlling spending and, and investing in law enforcement for safe communities and focusing on excellence in education and parents' decision-making authority in schools over their kids. And that includes choice, but it also includes these most important decisions in their kids' lives. That, in fact, government can work better. It can work better. And, uh, and we should be for an efficient government that works for our citizens, not telling them what to do all the time. And, and finally, that our Constitution was drafted in a way that, in fact, makes it a document that we should protect, not trample on. These aren't Republican values. I think they're American values. And I do expect Republicans to do very well on November the 8th. I want to thank everybody. Thank you for spending this time with us this morning. Thank you for getting up and coming over here early after breakfast. And uh, I just, I thank you, David. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. Mr. Youngkin, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoyed thank it. You. Thank you very much.